Hi, I'm Professor Michelle Barber and welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today I'm speaking with Konstantina Psoma, CEO and founder of KDIM. Konstantina, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks a lot for inviting me. So let's start with the obvious question. Tell me a little bit about your company, KDIM. Sure. So essentially at KDIM, we use machine learning technology uh, to take 2D images and turn them into 3D models quite quickly. Uh, the idea came a couple of years ago uh, because of my personal struggle with 3D modeling and how difficult it can be. Uh, and so I was looking for a way to accelerate the whole process. Uh, but yeah, currently we're working mainly with gaming companies, um, accelerating their 3D asset creation and looking into some like other exciting applications as well. Before I go any further, so this was effectively a challenge you faced for your own work, but while solving the problem for yourself, you've solved it for a whole bunch of other people and customers beyond that, is that right? Yeah, we're in progress, like in the process of that. Uh, essentially, it is a big problem, especially in the gaming industry. Um, for me personally, I was doing a lot of 3D modeling and animation units while I was at uni. Um, the technology that we are creating is quite hard um, and there is a part of a quality control step um, that we haven't get, gotten rid of yet. Um, but yeah, we are solving this problem for our partners currently and our customers currently, and hopefully in a much larger degree in the years to come. So can you tell me a little bit about the sorts of partners you work with and, and what it is they want to do with KDEM? Essentially, we're working with gaming companies. Mm. Um, most of them use our tool, our web app, to accelerate their 3D asset creation. And how do they do that? So essentially, gaming companies work uh, with 2D art as a first step. So imagine people are like drawing concept art of a character, of like a scene, of objects inside the scene. Um, so what would happen next? It would be that those art pieces would go to the 3D artist mm -hmm. and he would have to start from scratch from a single cube and start um, doing all of those little operations on it to achieve a basic shape. So what we do is instead of getting the art pieces, the 2D art, directly to the 3D artist. We actually pass them through our algorithms, which create the basic 3D shape ready for them so they can start from something that's like 80% there um, in, in a, like a good case scenario um, and kind of like spend all of their time polishing the asset instead of like starting from scratch each time. So like accelerating the whole workflow, essentially. It sounds like it's using the artist's artistic skills as opposed to the kind of like the, the right. more sort of simple but time consuming bit at the beginning. And you mentioned a few minutes ago that you that's, that's your principal aim is, is in the gaming industry at the moment, but you've got other ideas of where this might go in future. Can you give me a couple of examples as to what that might be? Of course. Um, like currently we like to keep our focus in the gaming industry because for a startup focus is super important. We can't like go into 3D marketing or, you know, Product design, there's a lot of areas we could go. Um, there is a common theme that is coming up a lot. And that theme is, oh yeah, that's great. We would love to use it to accelerate our in-house production. But what if we could actually use it to give our end users, so imagine the player of the game, the ability to upload a photo or a sketch that they did and turn it into a 3D model themselves and put it in the game. So we are now discovering a new area that's not kind of like uh, common at the moment of 3D user generated content. So giving the power to common people that like you and me don't have the ability to 3D model um, to contribute in a 3D context. But we could through that medium like actually occupy space in the game. Exactly. Case. So tell me a bit about how this started. I think you were a student when the, the idea or the genesis of KDEM sort of came about. I was studying here at the University of Bristol. I did computer science with innovation. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was actually part of the first cohort of innovation students started in 2016. Yeah. Um, that was great. <laughs> uh, so the idea came during my third year of uni. Um, I was doing a lot of 3D modeling, character and set design, and later animation. And I had completely underestimated the task. So I was like, great, I'll be able to create in 3D. How hard can it be, you know? So I chose for the project to model a cathedral up in um, Clifton. And 
the professor had warned us. He was like, don't go big. I was like, that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to be fine. Uh, so I did choose the cathedral and I found myself modeling day and night. Huge frustration, huge amount of time spent on that project at the same time other projects running. So I was like, no way, you know, no it has way. has to be another way. It has to be another way. Yeah. So I go and talk to Artman Animations. I was like, hey guys, um, tell me your secret, you know. Games have to create millions of 3D objects to populate their 3D worlds. Uh, no way you do this one by one by hand, right? And they were like, no. <laughs> and they were like, there is no secret. And this is how we do it. And I was like, no, no way. Wow. No. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, if you do it like that, then like no hope. I, I can't do it, literally. Um, so anyway, so that was what started things off. I then started reading a couple of articles by Sean Layden, who is the ex-chairman of PlayStation. Mm -hmm. And he was just like bringing, uh, making aware the world of how expensive it is to create games. And one of the reasons it was because of how expensive it is to create 3D models for the games, and like hundreds of thousands of them. And so this was super interesting. I was like, okay, uh, we're onto something here. There's a big problem here. Yeah. There's a big problem as well. Like people feel this pain. It's really expensive. The problem is really expensive. Later, I actually got in touch with Son, and he's actually part of our advisors oh, wow. at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So that was when you were a student. What was your What was your next step? Because there's lots of great ideas come out of a student population, but to actually make it into a fully fledged functioning company, it's it's not straightforward. Where did you have to go next after you graduated? After graduation, the the first six months after I left uni was the most difficult. Mm -hmm in the history of like Kadim. But we had a lot of help. Before I go to that, um, so during my last year, mm -hmm. uh, which was my master's year, I actually had the chance to work on the project, mm -hmm. even though um, it could be considered kind of like a side project mm -hmm. or you know, a side hassle. And that was because I was part of the innovation uh, like cohort. Yeah. So as part of my master's, we actually had the chance to do a startup like Kind of like fake a startup. Yeah, sure. But we actually did it. Okay, so you did it for real. <laughs> exactly. So we did it for real. This is where the Basecamp team from the university played a huge mm -hmm. like role uh, with the new enterprise competition. Like the new enterprise competition with the 10K grant that we got at the end was what allowed us to keep going after uni because I both myself and my co founder didn't have the resources to actually keep going after that. We would have to find jobs. Anyway, so we got that. At the time, I was like, 10K, what a huge amount of money. 10K sounds like such a small number, but when you have zero, 10 is everything. In my, my first investment was 20. Yeah. And it felt like, yeah, the world, the world. is my oyster. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. So what did you do with your 10K? Well, to continue this, we need proper money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After a month, we realized, okay, 10K is like nothing. Uh, so essentially, we were just like sustaining ourselves um, with as little as possible until we can kind of like close our first round. So it's like, okay, we need to, to get some money in. And well, I don't know how we did it. Like really looking back, I'm like, okay, we found this person, he gave us 150,000. Okay. Um, he's like a super angel. Yeah. Um, and he's actually the founder of Rebellion Games. This is someone that understood the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. He's the founder of a gaming company. Correct. I guess, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I guess you must have explained what you were trying to achieve and he got it. Because that first investor is so important, isn't it? You, you don't want yes. someone that is just looking at it as an investment opportunity. You want someone who's behind the story. He really buys what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, he came on board. So we're like, okay, we can start now. We can grow the team, bring on like talented people on board, start building. Mm -hmm. Because until then, it was just like prototypes, it was letters of intent, it was discussions, but nothing, you know, very real. But at the same time, you need those to get to the next step. If you'd gone to that investor without any letters of intent, without any prototypes, chances are he'd have said, that's nice, but come back when you got a little bit more. When I look back at those months, I think that we could have done more, mm. even more. There, was, there were like some difficult situations with like, okay, we can't meet anyone. Uh, we just rely on people replying on cold emails and cold LinkedIn messages. But yeah, looking back, I'm like, probably like, if I knew what I know now, I would have done more. I would have like made much stronger prototypes, mm -hmm. 
go you know in a much stronger way because we were quite reluctant we were quite shy also with the investor discussions this person wasn't the only one who mm. actually offered so we had two terms mm. at the end i couldn't believe it i was like two terms <laughs> i ca i can choose now yeah uh so with investor discussions as well like there's a huge amount to be learned i was treating investors back then as you know someone i have to persuade to mm. believe in me but actually it's also the other way around too which i learned yeah. la later i was like hey but why would i give you shares of my yeah company? why would i let you yeah, invest exactly, in my company exactly. i think that's really common other people have said that to me that you think of it as, as selling your your pitch your ideas mm -hmm. your your technology but it, it needs to be a really mutually constructive relationship, doesn't it? Choosing the right investor. So you, you had your initial investment. Has that led you to unlock investment from, from other bodies, from VC funds, or have you stuck with your one investor throughout? So that investor came on board uh, at the end of 2020. That led to another fundraising round uh, last summer where we got like another 10 uh, angel investors on board plus um, a VC, but still like a, a small round mm -hmm. in, in the US, they would still call that pre-seed. Mm -hmm. So both of the rounds were amounting to one million. Mm -hmm. Exciting. That's not a small amount of money by most people's standards. I suppose you, you referred a little bit to what you might do differently if you had your time again just a year or two ago. What if you looked a little bit further along? Uh, a little bit further back in history. Mm. 10 years ago, did you see yourself as the founder and CEO of a company like this? Is that how, how young Constantina would have pictured her future? What would you say to that, that young person to encourage her? I would never have imagined it 10 years ago, no. I was, 10 years ago, I was, uh, yeah, 13 years old. Actually, I grew up in, in my family. My dad, um, is a founder and he had his own company. So I grew up with a lot of absence. Mm. So if you had asked me 10 years ago, I'd be like, I, what I want to do is anything but what my dad does. Yes. Anything different. Yeah, anything different. Yeah. I actually had a, a very uh, big um, attraction to anything outdoors and mm. sports and all of that. I don't know how I ended up here, to be honest, <laughs> because I had a huge uh, love for yeah. outdoors and stuff like that. But if you had asked me, like, when I, when I came to uni and I started doing computer science and I started learning how I can solve real problems with technology and also with, through innovation, the innovation degree, how they taught us how to look at problems, mm. how to look at opportunities and kind of like making them come to life with mm -hmm. something you build. That's your own. That is what got me stuck. I really love having something of my own. So it sounds like a lot of the really crucial progress was made during that master's year of your degree. Did you have any particular sort of support? Was there someone who influenced you, challenged you, pushed you? Yeah, for sure. So being part of the innovation cohort, um, each of the teams that we like had decided to do a startup for our masters, uh, got assigned a supervisor. So ours was Andy and he was the founder himself. He sold his company to Twitter. And essentially he really knew like all the right things uh, at this point, or I don't know, he, he was very motivating as a person. And also he made some great connections for us, like uh, in Artman Animations, which actually got us going because we had the chance to talk to people about our idea hear their feedback and like move forwards. And then winning the new enterprise competition was a huge catalyst to like where we are currently. I can well imagine. Sometimes you can sort of look around and think, well, I only know these, these people, but actually you know the shell of people around you, but they know a whole load more. And it sounds like you're able to access information, knowledge, insights, perspectives from a much wider group of people. For sure. And actually, that's something that I didn't know then, but I know now. It's like when you find someone who's willing to help, oh, make them help you. Make yeah. them, make them like give you all the interest they can, they can give you. Politeness doesn't work with business. You have to be, you know, getting what you want. I mean, that sounds like a, a, a piece of advice you might give to someone starting out where you were sort of two or three years ago. Are there any other words of wisdom you'd offer to somebody, maybe in that position you were sort of, your final year, your master's year, when you've, you've got this idea, this really solid idea, but there's some challenges ahead. What would you say to that person? I actually think that at that point during my master's year, I was quite unaware of what I was going into. 
And I think I was quite unaware for a long time. So if there was one thing that I would kind of like tell to myself, like one year ago, or even one and a half years ago, when this was like just an idea, it would be to look at other startups that have succeeded, but actually look back mm. to the days they started and really understand what a, a startup culture is, because that's what I didn't know. Mm. I think that startups are like war. Mm. It's like super competitive. You can't like be working nine to five and do a startup because it requires so much of yourself. And that's why not many people want to do them, right? Because it's a way of living. Mm. It's a way of lifestyle. And you have to have the strength to give much of yourself to mm. that thing. I didn't know that. A lot of my first steps were not into the right direction of, okay, we're getting momentum. We are working very hard. We are accelerating. Um, we are hiring the best of the best, you know? And so I made mistakes. Hmm. But now, now I know, and actually, how do I know? I met with other founders hmm. that are really successful, that have kind of like cracked um, what it means to be a very early stage startup. I'm not saying that this is the case for like a f five to 10 year old company, but at the beginning, hmm. like the whole founding team needs to work with a huge amount of um, ambition. And I actually made the, those mistakes. So I hired wrong. Mm. I hired people who are not missionaries, mm -hmm. but mercenaries. And that's mm. the most common mistake, but you need to fix that. Yeah. Well, sometimes we can learn from those around, yeah. around us. Sometimes we have to make the mistakes ourselves and really For learn. Sure. And I think that's probably something that characterizes quite a lot of founders is they're willing to make mistakes. And, and bounce back and show that resilience and, and not be... Fail fast. Yeah. Yeah. Fix the mistakes. Move on. Yeah. Don't make them again. <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let me, let me ask you one more. Let's, we're sitting here. What if I interview again in five years? What will you be telling me then? My goal would be by then to kind of like have cracked, mm -hmm. if not all of what we want to do in, for the games, um, like industry. The majority would be like... Um, are on the tech side of things, our machine learning algorithms are there or are getting there. We have customers worldwide and they are all loving the product. Yeah. Obviously, uh, we're making a real impact both on how 3D asset creation happens, but also enabling people that are end users of other products to contribute to either that's a game or a metaverse or just a 3D experience. For myself personally, I have realized over the past like six months to a year that this is my thing. So even when I feel that Kadim has um, fulfilled its vision, I'm going to go to the next thing. But obviously I would want to see that kind of like finished. I'm not looking to like exit uh, prematurely. I want to realize the full potential of what I'm doing because I, I believe it's, it's a huge potential. You just have to have an open mind. Um, to learn and to also be open to listening, mm. take into everything you can, obviously think about it, form your own opinion, form your own strategy, form your own ideas, but just listen to other people. There's a fine line between having your strategy and your ideas and being rigid mm -hmm. and not taking into account the environment. And that's something I've seen sometimes if people are so set on the track of what they're gonna achieve that they're just blinkered to what's yeah. around them. I think that's quite dangerous. But also like see how other people succeeded. Yeah. Sure. Like, look around you. What did this person did so right to have such a good team, you know? How did this person manage to close a funding round in two days? Mm. What did they do right? Just talk to them, ask them. Yeah. Learn, learn from them. Learn from someone who is doing something really good. And I guess there's so much now that you could teach someone just a year or two behind you in the, in the process. Do you ever, are you tempted to act as a mentor and bring people along in your kind of in your footsteps? How do you ask that? <laughs> because I am actually a mentor now to the new enterprise competition oh, um, cohort that are now like competing for, for the growth stage. But yeah, I love that. I actually love that aspect. And I think many entrepreneurs start their journey thinking about, about money or fame or like, I don't know, success in general. But actually along the way, what motivates me is actually being a role model to like a kid in Greece that is now 15 years old. And have they thought about this? Have they thought that this could be their life? If not, 
then they might think about it if they see someone else doing it. Seeing someone else that looks like you in, in whatever that means to you, that representation is so, so important. Exactly. Because really, I didn't have anyone when I was growing up being like a female mm. entrepreneur that is doing something exciting and all of that. So yeah. hopefully, I think that's now what excites me more in terms of like other people. I think, and I think I'm confident you're an inspiration mm. to a whole generation of young women and I'm sure young men as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, but also so open and honest. I am positive that, that Kadim and also you are going to achieve all sorts of exciting things. So I look forward to watching your progress, hopefully meeting you again to, to hear where you are in the future. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you for having me. And I think it's always important to showcase like both positive and negative sides of a startup. Absolutely. You can't <laughs> have the one without the other. Couldn't completely agree. Thank Thanks. you so much. If you've been inspired by what you've seen today and think it might be relevant to your research or your work, then please feel free to contact us and enjoy the rest of the enterprise sessions.